As the head of the National Cares Mentoring Movement and former editor-in-chief of Essence Magazine, media icon Susan L. Taylor has tirelessly advocated on behalf of black women and black America. An author, mother, mentor, wife, and activist, Susan L. Taylor, on this episode of Leading Women. Susan Taylor is love unconditional personified. Susan is the most generous person that I've ever met. Feminist, womanist, visionary, the kind of leader we all should aspire to be. She's beautiful, but more than that, there are a lot of beautiful people. She's just magnetic. You know that something's going on in there and you want to find out what it is. Black, beautiful, strong, intelligent, and, and just caring. I don't know if I can do it in one sentence, but I wish I could be more like her. Susan Taylor represents black female excellence. My father had probably the first boutique the first store owned by an African-American or an African-Caribbean, or black person, I should say, in East Harlem. So I grew up in my father's store, Larry's Specialty Shop at 78 East 116th Street. And it's really where I learned how to present myself and count pennies, and I sold stockings, and I graduated to panties, and, and then bras, and blouses, and skirts. And so my first effort really was my own cosmetics company, which is how I came to Essence. I started the Quay Cosmetics, named after my daughter. The same year Essence was created, the editors heard about me. I heard about them too and realized that black women who had journalism degrees weren't interested in writing about anything as mundane as beauty. And that's how I got my foot in the door. As the magazine began to grow, I realized that there would be a conflict. But you know, my marriage broke up and my husband kept the cosmetics company and I found myself on my own, no man, no money, my business gone and I was just struggling. And I found myself in a hospital, 24 years old, in the, in the emergency room on a Sunday morning thinking I was having a heart attack. I was working at Essence, making $500 a month and my rent was $368. And I remember that day leaving the emergency room and having the doctor tell me that I wasn't having a heart attack, but an anxiety attack. And I started walking up Broadway right here in Manhattan and I looked up and there was a sign that said United Palace Church Service 3 p.m. And a force just pulled me into the back of that church. And I heard the Reverend Alfred Miller preach a sermon that changed my life. He said that with our minds we control our world. And he said, God is alive in you. I'd never heard that. I grew up Catholic, went to Catholic schools. I thought the nuns and the priests had the direct line to God. I never knew that there was anything sacred about me. And before I knew it, I had an idea. Oh, I'm a cosmetologist. I can teach the models at Ophelia Divorce School of Charm how to put on makeup and do their hair. Suddenly, there was another paycheck. I think I walked, felt differently. Marsha Angelespie, the then editor-in-chief of Essence, offered me another job the fashion and beauty editor's job. I went from making $500 a month in essence to $16,500 a year. Changed my and my daughter Shauna's life. Many people can identify with her that she was a single parent for a period of time raising her daughter, uh, working at Essence and trying to juggle that and, and going to school. When I joined Essence, I had no more than a high school diploma. It was a commercial one at that. I had never written anything beyond high school composition. But those extraordinary sisters down there, and some brothers too, really taught me how to write my beauty copy, taught me how to do everything that I learned how to do at Essence. I was the beauty editor for a year, fashion and beauty editor for nine years. And then when the editor-in-chief spot was offered to me, I was incredulous. Oh, there's no way, high school graduate, you know, no literary background. I mean, I know Alice Walker, knew her work and Toni Morrison, but had I read that? No. So I knew that there would be outrage, and there was, you know, very quietly, but some people called our then publisher, Ed Lewis, and said, how could you, you know, give the fashion and beauty editor a literary 
jewels. You're the fashion editor. You're really in the center of the book, and you're laying out stuff just as if you were laying out the whole magazine, because oftentimes fashion, those images are what sell a magazine. And so it's not that big a jump for Susan Taylor to go from fashion editor to editorial, or to editor-in-chief, because you already are in all the meetings that are talking about the entire magazine. It's just a matter that you're adding more work to your plate. You know, I didn't believe that I could do it, and when Ed offered me the job, I actually laughed at him. But I came home, and there was a man in my life at the time, Mel Nunes, who was an attorney. I called Mel, and I said, you'll never guess what. They're <laughs> thinking of me for the editor-in-chief's position. Isn't that a joke? And Mel just, you know, in his very gentle way, said, no joke. You have exactly what black women need. That's all I needed to hear from someone who I so greatly respected. You know, the next morning, I was in Ed Lewis's office, leaning over his desk, I'm ready, you tell me when. She came in and she talked to us about her promotion, that she was going to be the new editor-in-chief. And that in the same breath as humble as Susan is, she told each of us what our new responsibilities were gonna be. Having to experience doubters who thought that, well, she wasn't exactly a trained journalist, how was she going to pull this off? And then she defied all the odds and not just, not just took command of the magazine, but is known throughout the world as an icon, America's, uh, America's queen, as, as it were. But just sharing who she was and helping you to understand that the power was in you to do anything that you wanted to do, as long as you kept your eye on the prize and stayed focused. So I came to the editor-in-chief's position with a real philosophy about what we needed to give women and that we needed to empower them so that they could hold the reins on their lives in their hands and with that care for the community. So that was always the mandate. It was a very nurturing, very supportive environment. And so I know uh, people who cycled in and back out of, of the organization, they'd go off and try a venture and if it didn't uh, succeed, she had a chair for them. She had a desk for them and, a, and a, a welcoming smile when they came back. I can tolerate ineptness a little longer than I can disrespect. So I just never wanted anyone to disrespect anyone else on the staff and insisted that we all treat one another just like I treated them. When I became editor-in-chief, I said, oh my Lord, what am I ever gonna write about? The fashion and beauty editor who's really not a writer, not a literary person at all. You know, what am I going to do? And I tried to get out of writing the column. And our then publisher, Ed Lewis, said, I'm so sorry, the editor, the readers have to know you. And um, no deal. So I said, okay, let me write about what I want to know so deeply within myself. And that's our relationship with our creator, by whatever name we may call the divinity. The divine intelligence that created us put an aspect of itself within us. And we can go through life, live and die, and never know that. Never know how to serve it, how to bind with it, how to amplify it. And so I said, that's what I'm going to pursue writing about as I learn more about it myself. Susan took the conversations that we had across the kitchen table privately, or sometimes not at all, and put it on the table and said, it's okay to talk about it because I'm talking about it, I'm putting my face on it. She opened up a dialogue. She put black women's voices in the, in the world. Susan's in the spirit touched us and connected us because you knew, okay, I'm reading in the spirit, so is my sister in Detroit, so is my sister in East St. Louis and Atlanta. So for this month, we all have this idea that we're contemplating. The In the Spirit column made a unique contribution because it's something anybody could read and draw something from. People meet this woman that they've grown up with. They meet this woman that forged such an intimate connection with them through her popular column in the spirit. So they feel like they know her. They feel like for 20 plus years, she's been speaking directly to them. One night I was working late and she was working late and she had these two huge bags that she was carrying. And I said, Susan, let me help you with these bags, you know, to walk her to her car service. And the, I was astonished at how heavy the bags were. I said, Susan, what is in these bags? And uh, she said, that's reader mail. I said, all of that's reader mail? Don't your assistants help you go with the mail? She said, no, the assistants have gone through the mail already, but this is the stuff that I'm personally taking home to read. I said, you, you read all this reader mail? She said, yes, Gordon. She said, 
these are our readers and these people make me who I am. What got me reading the magazine was actually those In the Spirit columns that Susan wrote because they were just this kind of empowering self-help thing. And you know, in the beginning, I remember I used, to, I used to hide the magazine, like I don't want anyone to see me reading this magazine, you know what I mean? Just, you know, ridiculous notions of manhood, you know what I mean? The dudes don't read Essence. But I know people from around the country who say to this day that there was a column by Susan Taylor that really changed their life or saved their life. And I've seen, I've seen it up close and personal. When I've gone to the Essence Music Festival and you see 50, 60, 75,000 people there and they all know who Susan Taylor is because of that column, that says how incredible that column is. Essence is read in every household by every member. That tells you a lot about its dedication and its commitment to moving our lives forward. So it wasn't just about creating the empowered woman, it was about creating empowered families. The challenge that I had at Essence, that we all had and still have, is really advertising pages. It's really getting those marketers to respect the black female dollar, the spending power in black America. The Essence image is at odds with what a lot of advertisers want to portray as, as black culture, black family life, uh, or, or black women. So I know she was involved in some, some pretty high profile fights there. No one's done in publishing what she's done. She was a first. Essence was born because there was nothing else on the newsstand that looked like us, talked to us about our every need and desire. And so when we came to the magazine, I remember one of the first things she said to me is we put this magazine out for and about ourselves. Susan's impact on Essence is that she was able to push out our, our black pride and accentuate that. In the black community, I would say that Essence has really been um, a refutation and a, um, uh, an answer to a lot of the cultural assault that is aimed at black women in particular and the black community in general. When it goes down in history, 100 years from now, you talk about Essence Magazine, you're going to talk about the, the impact that Susan Taylor had on building that magazine, from helping to build it from the ground up, and really becoming the face and the, and, uh, that's associated with the magazine. Susan Taylor is Essence Magazine the way Jan Winter is Rolling Stone, the way Hugh Hefner is Playboy. She was not just trying to sell magazines or sell products, but trying to transform people. She made Essence Magazine like one of the most profitable publications in history. She was also a, a, a great team leader, and I think she, she brought that into it. When I've seen her work, she always let her team shine. I get a lot more credit for building the brand Essence than I feel I deserve, because my smartness, my brilliance, is I hire the smartest people I can find. I treat them well and pay them well. And it was really those women who just did the critical work over those, I'd say, 20 years when we just built Essence into the powerhouse that it is today. And of course the marketing teams and, you know, led by the, the men who were there too. I never thought to write a book. It was readers who initially said, we want a book from you. You know, we love reading one page, but we need more. And so I was pushed to create the first In the Spirit book that was not really an inclusion of my columns. What I did was I looked at the columns and I said, oh no, and I collapsed them into chapters, the wisdom, the ideas. And then I continued to do books, and my latest book, All About Love, really was the idea of the readers again who would come to see me at speaking engagements and come with my work bound and would ask me again and again to please put their favorites in a book. That first book of Combining all of her In the Spirit essays to me was um, just a powerful collection and one that I'll always have. And more importantly, it's one that I'll pass on to my children. All About Love is really the offering to our community. It represents the pillars, the foundation that I feel keeps us strong, fit, focused, organized, disciplined, believing in ourselves, and understanding that we live in a world of abundance and there's nothing to fear. Most women, most mainstream women, most white women don't have to negotiate their actual beauty every day. They don't have to define or defend who they are. And Susan's In the Spirit gave us the strength 
to just get up and get out in the morning, you know, and, and be who we are and think that we're beautiful with our hair and our noses and our behinds and our different shades of skin. Like she gave us um, a torch. She is a powerhouse, you know? I mean, that that's, you know, what, what, what's so rare about her is that she has actual literary gifts and she's also a very good manager. She had a following, she built an audience, she did all, all the things that a columnist is supposed to do. Babs and Lawrence. Boy, I tell you, they took no stuff. My father, I was afraid of him. I didn't get pregnant because my father would have killed me. I would have been a troublesome child. And I share this, I can talk about it now. It's something that I couldn't have spoken about earlier on. You know, early sexual activities, because I was, oh, I'm a love bug. I love hugging and kissing, and I didn't have those kinds of parents. And I'm not ashamed to say I say it, because I want young women to hear it. So I looked for the love and the affirmation that I really wanted from my father and my mother in the arms of the neighborhood boys. And I say to fathers, you have to love and affirm your girls. You have to tell them that they are smart. You have to hug them, you have to kiss them. And we have to teach them what love looks like, what's appropriate. Because if they don't get it from a father, if they don't get it from a male who loves them and honors them, they're gonna look for it usually in the arms of you know, people who might hurt them. My mother was really an extraordinary mother. She wasn't a, a loving, you know, gentle person. She said what she felt, and it would hurt your heart, and it hurt mine. And I, I've written about that so much, you know, that there's the myth of the loving, the ever-loving, warm and embracing black mother. She's very, very, very connected to her ancestors and draws on that when times are difficult. When we moved to Queens, it was a different environment for me. You know, living in Harlem, there was no place to play. I lived in a real thoroughfare. It's where people came to shop. It's where my father's store was. So it was a bustling community. And when I moved to Queens, it was a different world. They had activities for youngsters. They had, we would go to Mr. Hurd's barbershop on Friday evenings and Saturday evenings and have parties in the back. The parents out there, you know, they had cooking classes and music classes and, you know, block parties. And I'm so thankful today that my parents, even though their marriage wasn't a loving one, they stayed together. They stayed together for the children. My mother said it all the time, but for you all, I'd be out of here, I'd leave. My mother had an eighth grade education. She wouldn't have been able to take care of us well. There would have been no one home when I arrived from school. Again, my brother Larry would have done fine, but believe me, I would have been out there looking for the boys. I would have done things that were totally inappropriate, but for my parents sacrificing everything for their children. I can say things about my mother that my daughter can never say about me. I never heard my mother tell a lie. You know, my mother never said anything. It might not have been my truth, but whatever she said, she saw it as her truth, you know? And my mother just really cared deeply about other people. I watched my mother sell her home in Queens for a pittance of what it was worth because it was a little family that was struggling and they wanted to own a home but they couldn't afford it. She said, I'm gonna give it to them for $35,000. We were like, what? She said, absolutely, you know? So those, that, those are the qualities that my mother, you know, had that I really wanna breathe more life into in my own life. Motherhood seasoned me. I tell my daughter that, you know, parents aren't always right and we're not always wise. If there's anything that I could do over again, I wish I could mother my daughter all over again. I became a mother before I was emotionally or financially ready. Having a marriage breakup, I, I was on my own with Shauna from the time she was six weeks old. And as I look back on it, I'm like, we made it. You know, and she always says that, mommy, come on, you did a good job. You know, I didn't, that, I didn't understand the importance of motherhood when I became a mother. I rushed my baby through life. When she was three months old, I wanted her to be three years old, you know, so she could walk and button her own little stuff, you know. When she was three years old, I wanted her to be 13. And when she was 13, oh my God, I wanted her to be out of high school and off to college. And when she went off to college, I said, oh my God, I missed it. I missed the stages of her development because I was so focused on the next step. 
I was one year old when my mother first started working at Essence. So I don't remember the early days at Essence, but I have to say that um, Essence was like a sibling to me. Susan doesn't, doesn't think she was all that great as a mother. She thinks she spent too much time uh, at Essence and not enough time with Shauna. Shauna disputes that and tells Susan to stop telling people that. Maybe she feels like we didn't get to spend um, a lot of time together, but the times that we spent were just, I'll never forget. Uh, she's a wonderful person. The turning point for me might have come one evening. It was a Friday night, I'll never forget it. And it was around nine o'clock. My daughter had already been home from school by herself, you know, in the apartment waiting for me for hours. Mommy, when are you coming? I'm coming, I'm coming. Mommy, when are you coming? Nine o'clock, 10 o'clock. By 11, I was on my way home and she was putting on her coat. She couldn't have been any older than 12. She's putting on her coat. Where are you going? I was coming down to get you. Because at that time, Essence was in Times Square. And Times Square was filled with porn shops and thieves. It was really, a, you know, not a good place. I was like, oh my God. You know what, what I learned now? You have to give yourself to yourself before you give yourself away. I feel like I gave everything to Essence before I gave to myself and my daughter. And that night when my daughter came to pick me up from Essence, a 12 year old coming out of the house by herself down into the dangerous area of the then Times Square, it was a major wake up call for me. I don't know that I woke up fully, but from that point on I became a better mother. She knows that all children belong to all of us. And so her mothering instinct with Shauna extends out into the universe in terms of the young people that, that she has really helped to blossom in, in their lives. She's very important in my life. You know, she's uh, helped me in many, many ways. And I, I think that uh, looking at my wife, she's the most giving person I've ever met in my life. And I, I love her for that. Growing up with Susan as my godmother, I got a chance to see her as a mother. Um, you know, the way she would be with Shauna, um, you know, so loving, so caring, and, and just wanting the best, you know. Um, you know, she's a, a great executive, a great leader, a great role model, but she is a, a great mother first, and, um, you know, also a great godmother. Susan is never off the mission, and so even as a mother pushing Shana Nikwe forward, this is who you are. This is what you need to bring to the world. This is, as a mother yourself, what you need for the journey. One thing that my mother, that she really taught me in terms of being a mother, is to be gentle. To, you can say anything if you say it kindly. Everything that we need is right here at our fingertips. If only we will fa follow that divine design that was created for our lives. So motherhood really pushed me further toward that divine design and primarily, Motherhood helped me to become a circumspect parent. I have the best husband on earth, the divine right person, you know, and I think it's that I learned. I learned how to treat somebody. My first marriage, Billy and I almost killed each other, you know. Everything he called me, I put my hand on my hip and I called it back. And I always say, it was a brutal marriage. But I didn't leave that marriage because I thought he would kill me. I knew I'd kill him. Billy and I are so good today. We're friends. We love each other. He comes here for dinner with my husband, Kefra. We're all a family, you know? We've grown up. I introduced Susan and Kefra, and I think they have the most amazing uh, relationship. Kefra is so cool, so laid back. They just belong together. What I would say to couples about the glue, that keeps relationships connected. Sisters, we have to be respectful of our men. You have to know that brothers do not want to be corrected in front of anybody. They don't want to be shouted at. They don't want to be screamed at. I think you can get a man to do anything by just saying, sweetie, I don't know if you, you know, sweetie, can you go to the store and pick up so and so? Sweetie, do you mind so and so? I sweetie all day long. She uses that on me, you know, sweetie and the, you know, yeah, it all. It, it, I, I can't refuse. <laughs> the glue that keeps the relationship solid is keeping the tenderness alive, keeping those sweet words alive, watching your mouth. Each of us is a divine original, created to see the world through the prism of our own experience and our own eyes, and nobody is going to be exactly, not even exactly, nobody's going to be who we want them to be. We have to honor people and allow them to be who they are. 
she's a great wife. She's a great wife. She's, a, she's so loving and so gentle and such a tender person. So she's a great wife. And Kefra's happy. <laughs> what does she mean to me? Oh, she's like, she's like my sister and my wife and my girlfriend. And, uh, you know, she's, she's, I mean, we've been together 20-something years now. And, you know, she's, she's part of me. A lot of people don't know this, but she has mentored hundreds of children over the years, young people over the, over the years. She is everything to me. She is my mother. She is um, my friend. Um, I can't imagine a world without her. There is so much that I learned sitting in the chair across from her that will take me through the rest of my days that not only apply to work and the mission that is celebrating black womanhood, but just for life. The best thing that Susan ever did for me was when she called me into her office and said, Gordon, you've been doing incredible work here, but it's time for you to go. She said, I need you to train your assistant Yvette and to learn your position because it's time for you to go out there and live your dream, do your music, you'll do very, very well. I can say it now, there's many job opportunities, many financial opportunities that I owe to Susan Taylor because she just referred me to many, many people. I mean, she is tremendously generous with her, 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 her network and her resources. She's been somebody that I could talk to and get advice from, um, somebody that, you know, I, I would feel comfortable with listening to. Um, I think our relationship has gotten closer even though I'm a celebrity and she's a celebrity, we, I don't know, we don't really approach each other like that. Uh, I'm still like the, you know, like, like the little kid that she used to take care of. She just really brought me in close and took care of me and taught me so much about what she knows about how to be a good editor, a good colleague, and just a good person in the world. I mean, Susan really loved black women and really loved black people and that was the bar at the magazine that's why you were working and you were very clear why you were working and who you were working for had i not met her i would not i, I would not be here she taught me like to breathe and make sure that i just enjoy the things um, that i've worked hard to achieve but then also in a time of trouble to breathe and relax and to think and you know, that, that, that's a very powerful lesson. She's been a mother to writers like Asha Bendeli and Joan Morgan. You know, to this day, she still travels around with four or five, six different young women who are mentees, teenagers, early 20-somethings. She's a mother to them. I mean, Susan will literally take on folks who may have, you know, may not have had parents of their own, who may come from so-called broken homes or, you know, neighborhoods that are, you know, we call hood or whatever. And she's been, a, to me, Susan Taylor is really the mother in a lot of ways for a lot of us in black America, you know, spiritually, culturally, politically. Susan is one of the really great jewels of this country. She is a tremendous, tremendous advocate for issues that I think a lot of people really don't know about. People know Susan Taylor, the celebrity. They don't know Susan Taylor, the person. Susan, I think, is a spiritual force of nature. She is probably one of the most generous people that I know. Um, she believes in service. She believes that we were all put on this earth to do some good and to spread it around and she has basically given her life to doing so. Katrina changed my life. I think it changed all of our lives because we saw poor struggling black folk stranded on roofs and said, hey, could have been me. And we couldn't take the Essence Music Festival back to New Orleans that year. So for that year, we went to Houston. And I asked myself, what could I do with the 250,000 people who are going to come to party heartily that would make a critical difference in the life of our community? And I got the idea. Why don't we all get together and mentor? Because the government is not going to save us. So many of our young people are in major peril on our watch. And we know that our grands and great-grands did a better job of securing the vulnerable people, vulnerable people around them than we're doing. And there's a real demand, a need, 
for black men and black women, but in that order. And so I called up the celebrities I know. I called up Terrence Howard and Monique and Mary J and Common and Danny Glover and a whole host of people and just asked them, would you come? I called Jesse Jackson and Michael Eric Dyson and Marcia, so many folks, and they all came. Mark Morial, the Urban League, Bruce Gordon then was heading up the NAACP, uh, the National Negro uh, College Fund, you know, um, Michael Lomax came, and it was just amazing to see all of our leaders gather, the, the, the um, celebrities and community leaders, some who weren't known, and all of us were on one message, get involved. Let's do something. And that gave birth to Essence Cares. And having had six mentees myself, and having one who I met when she was incarcerated, who just graduated at the top of her class from college. And I didn't do much. I just brought her into Essence, had her next, I'm going to a meeting, come with me. You have questions, ask them. I'm going shopping, come with me. Chatting and, you know, just guiding, that's all. And I just said, if I'm who I say I am, I've spoken about the crisis. I've written about the crisis for years. I've pointed the finger at the White House, the State House, the city government. None of them are going to save our children. It's on us. Enough talk, it's time for action. And so I'm institutionalizing what was Essence Cares into the National Cares Mentoring Movement. And now it's alive in more than 20 cities around the country. We are the people who refuse to die. We believe we all have a responsibility to answer our children's cry for help. So we launched Essence Cares to offer media support to the National Cares Mentoring Movement, failing schools, the carnage in our communities, celebration of thug life, the over-incarceration and relentless demonization of black males, the demeaning of black women. No, not on our watch. So I'm in. 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 Are you? She gets the opportunity, post essence, to put all her energy into this to this this work. And the thing that Susan always says is that, you know, we've seen all this stuff happen with young people in our in our communities over the last 15, 20 years, not on our watch. Not on our watch. She keeps saying that so much that, you know, it's impacted a lot of us. And you see a lot of folks now, myself included, saying, you know what, we gotta be mentors as well. That all comes from Susan Taylor really putting that in our heads. She emails people and pulls them together and uh, and has founded this National Cares Mentoring Movement to recruit one million black men to, to mentor our, you know, struggling youth. I think that's, that's pretty, that's monumental. One of the things that she's done is to really try to demystify the whole notion of mentoring. Because, because people lead very, very busy lives and can sometimes ba barely handle their own lives, she's been able to provide the, the simple ways that you can go about taking a young person under your wing. All it requires is that you show up. We need to embrace our young people and really forewarn them about the ills, the perils, that it's easier to find yourself in prison than it is to get a book in some public schools. We have schools in which our children, only black and brown children, don't have textbooks in the wealthiest country in the world. But again, I'm not pointing the finger at anybody. I'm looking in the mirror. And I'm saying this is our responsibility, it's my responsibility to make sure that the children in our village, as an elder of the village, that the children are taken care of. The most revolutionary thing that we must do is learn how to love and support one another. It's a residual of slavery that we don't. All too often we're crabs in a barrel. And the people who hurt black people the most, it's other black people. We have to stop doing that. Marion Wright Edelman has said that for black children, this is the worst time for them since slavery. This is what I'm doing. I'm after you, <laughs> you know? I'm coming out there, I'm in black America. People are like, oh, we're not gonna see you in the magazine anymore. You know where you're gonna see me? In your community. And that's what I'm doing for the rest of my life, but it better not take all of my life, because I wanna put my feet up one day and be able to say that I was part of that vanguard that really cared enough. Middle class black people, you know, don't care enough about poor black people. We have to care more. And that's what I hope I can say at the end of the journey, you know. But I linked arms and aims with caring black folk, and we took care of the least among us.
I may appear to be confident, I'm not all the time. And that's what I write about, that's what I speak about, that's what I'm traveling the country, you know, crusading about. Saying to our young people that I too have major bouts of depression and, you know, lack of confidence and feeling like I'm not enough, but none of those things are true. You know, if you're depressed, you may need medication, that's not my issue. I don't need the medication, I just need to change my mind. So the days that I step powerfully in the world, into the world, it's because I've done my homework. You know, the homework, giving myself to myself before I step out into the world. Remembering that we are more than enough. You have everything you need to fulfill your purpose. The more you do and the more you give, the happier you are. I mean, she, she's sort of a rock, walking advertisement for the good life. She is also a role model to remind people that when they become successful, their obligations to others to help them up that ladder only increases. Eight million readers who have read her editorial every month for 20 something years, you know? So, and, uh, and the inspiration that he is, she has brought to millions of people in that way, that, that's a huge legacy. We were working late and we were having a meeting and she says, I have to go home to give, a, give um, this reader a call. And I just said, well, who's the reader? She said, well, there's a reader who wrote me and said that she was on the borderline of taking her own life. And I promised that I would call her every evening, you know, for an hour or so to just give her some, some support, you know, for a week. And so, you know, I've been, this is my third day and she's really making progress and she's gonna do this and she's gonna do it. Susan saved that woman's life. And I know she did it for many more people than that, just that woman. She always thinks to do the right thing and that's why she'll always be blessed. And we'll always need her to be doing something to make the world a better place, especially for black people. She is one of the most powerful women in the world, bringing together black folks and white folks together and uniting us, the whole community as a whole. You don't have the time for me to tell you what Susan Taylor's legacy will be. I, I couldn't begin to sum that up. I think she will be remembered for her heart, because she gave so from her heart, like she gave, she gave you the real. You know, she pulled no punches and she gave you her heart. She gave you herself. And that's what we dig about her. That's what we love about her. She taught us to love one another and all of our beauty and all of our differences. Taught us to enjoy the process in joy and pain. Susan was the pioneer that said, no, we feel, we think, we're excellent, we perform. So when you see a mixture, a balance of mind and body, you're looking at what Susan Taylor gave Black America. If you've ever seen her, I felt her in a room, um, you, you know that she's taking black women forward. Um, that, that, that's her plight, that's her movement. Oprah said something. She said, you know, Susan had the courage to put an overweight black woman on the cover of a magazine when nobody else, nobody else was checking for Oprah. Susan knew that this woman was special and, and put her on the cover. She's just been so instrumental in shaping how African-American women feel about themselves by the selection of the people that she's put on the covers because she knows that sends a message to women that shows them that they're beautiful. It shows them that they can be successful. So she took that process very seriously. I think my greatest career accomplishment is that I have turned over the reins to the next generation. She will continue to inspire women she will continue to inspire me, and I'm just excited. I want to go along for the ride with Susan Taylor. I hope I'm a part of it in some way because she's an inspiration and she's a mentor. I think that she will just build this national, national cares movement into a, a forever lasting institution that people will really and really truly understand because it's coming out of her mouth that when you do something for somebody else, you are the one who gets the gift. I see Susan building a national movement and invigorating some of the most brilliant minds. I believe in us. I believe in black people. I look at what we have done against all odds. You know, whose intention was it for us to walk out of slavery? Whose intention was it for us to wage the Montgomery bus boycott, black folk, walking for more than a year through two winters, you know, determined that we were going to stand for respect, 
So I do believe in us. I think what we have to do is really come back to those traditional black values that created the lives that many in my generation are living and that we didn't necessarily pass along so well. We dropped the baton. We dropped the baton, but I believe in us and I believe in God in us. That God is alive in us. There is nothing in the church or in the sky that's gonna save your life. The Holy Spirit is the breath of life in you, always. Even when you feel crazy, even when things are falling apart, God is right there, the breath. All you have to do is get still and connect with it. Close your eyes and in the stillness just say, what is the next step I should take? It's life whispering to you. I'm with you, I'm yours, use me. This is an abundant universe. Have a plan, put one foot in front of the other. You'll reach not just your destination, but a place more magnificent that you never even dreamed you'd occupy. Susan, I think you know you don't have a bigger fan in the whole world than me, or a more grateful one. Thank you for all the good you've done and all the good you will do. Hello Susan, it's your godson Sean. I know this is a big thing for the whole world to realize that you're my godmother, um, but I'm very proud that you are my godmother. And I want to tell you, thank you for changing the world and, and making the world a better place for all of us to live. I wouldn't trade the experiences that we shared for anything in the world. I know you wish you could have been home baking cookies, but you were busy working trying to keep our heads above the water. And I, I just, now that I'm a mother, I cannot say, I, I can't say I could do that on my own. I just love you. Hey girl, I just want to tell you that I love you, love you, love you. Thank you for just being a light in my life and encouraging me when I didn't think that I could. And just for plain old being a sister's road dog. Love you, stay strong. I love you so much. I love you. Thank you.